When something happens in our children's school, why won't you tell us all the facts? That's the discussion on this edition of the Inside Scoop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Inside Scoop. I'm David Owen. Every now and then, something happens in a school that shouldn't. Someone does something that causes everyone great concern. As parents, we want to know the details. After all, my child is in that building, so I deserve to know, right? Well, it's not actually that simple. Here to discuss what happens at a time of crisis are three of the people directly involved in the process. John Floresta, the Chief Strategy and Accountability Officer. And uh, on this end is Josh Morial of School Safety and Operations. And then right square in the middle is Gretchen Walton, the Assistant Superintendent of Compliance and Legislative Affairs. Guys, thank you so much for being here. John, let's let's start with you, John. What kind of incidents are we talking about? We said crises happening in the school. What what typically is something that that we would see in a school? Yeah, and and as I answer that question, you are rattling off our titles. It's a lot of words uh, for all three of us. I think probably (laughs) the most important title for all of us, we're moms and dads. And so uh, um, when there are crises in the buildings, we are experiencing them as professionals and we're trying to provide support for our staff, our parents and our students, but we experience them as parents. Um, and, and so to answer your question, uh, the incidents are as wide as your imagination can imagine. Um, you have student discipline issues, you have uh, operational issues with buildings like, um, I don't know, the, uh, the microwave catches a popcorn on fire, I think it happens, <laughs> yeah. it happens every now and then. We, uh, are, we have 113 schools, so something's probably wrong with a building at, at any given time. We have great maintenance uh, staff, um, air conditioning units, um, uh, plumbing problems, you name it. And that's just part of being a big district with, with big buildings. Um, and we also have, again, student-centered issues. Some are discipline, some are safety-related, whether it's fights, whether it's threats to the building or at least perceived threats to the buildings. Um, I could keep going. But uh, the same issues that are inside of a mom and dad's living room make their way into mm-hmm. the classroom. They just go from the living room onto the bus into the schools. So, Josh, how, how does the, the chain of communication happen? I mean, it's, uh, you, you don't get to be in all the schools at, at one time. How, how does that – how do you become aware of an issue? Well, our first step is as soon as we are aware of an issue, we immediately move to student safety, staff safety. And that is my number one focus. Communication is always second. Very important on the list of things to do. But mm-hmm. my first focus is making sure all students and staff are safe and making sure the right people know. And then when we communicate, it's not always to communicate fast. It's to communicate accurately. And mm-hmm. sometimes the investigation does take a few minutes for us to um, understand wind, find out what is going on, make sure that the police have responded appropriately and that we then can communicate to our community, to our parents, to our staff that everyone is safe and what we need to do next. So uh, just to, to kind of summarize that, that, priority is put on staff and, and response communication. Absolutely. That is our first focus is all the calls we need to make to make sure the response needed is at the school as quickly as possible. Gotcha. And Josh, um, just our day to day, you know, really for all three of us, and there's we all have staff who are involved in these too. While one is happening, we might have another that's starting at the same time, right? So, you know, we're on the phone, (laughs) our staff's talking, um, we're making sure that students and staff are safe first and foremost, and that the rest of the steps are happening. And at the same time, there's probably something going on someplace else (laughs) every day, all day. Um, It feels like that's our common, common experience. 114 schools with 110,000 plus students, (laughs) it is normal to have different situations going on throughout the day yeah yeah no i've i've uh, frequently said on the podcast and probably more than people want to hear that i've got a lot of kids and that's just in my household i can't imagine 110,000 students and all of the potential for mayhem they bring to the picture right <laughs> <laughs> that's that's got to be something so john what uh, what challenges do we typically face in communicating during a crisis scenario yeah it's complicated we we said we're 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 all parents right um, so we want to communicate as much as we can as fast as we can we know the most important 
um, people in in our uh, parents' lives are our kids, right? And and uh, we know when you hear something on social media, you see a headline, you get a text from your from your kid, uh, maybe from a teacher. Mm-hmm. You, you want all the information, and you want it right now. Yep. So do I. Um, and and it's not quite as simple as that. I heard you say that earlier. And and there's a lot of complexity to it from a communications lens. Only, and I think you know, there's three of us here for a reason because there's more that goes into what we communicate than just what do we want to communicate. But we want right. to communicate fast. We want to communicate details, and we want to communicate accurately. Um, you heard Josh say earlier, we want to make sure that it's right, and we really start there. Yeah. Um, but we understand the the desire for our parents to hear as much as fast as possible, and so we build communication that way. Yeah. And it actually starts with what are all the facts. Let's build communication, text messages, email, social media posts for our parents. And then usually we scale it back based on conversations with these two and their staff on what we can and cannot say for a variety of reasons. But from a communication lens only, we want to say as much as we can. We want to say it as fast as we can. We want it to be accurate. Um, and we pull back from there, if that makes sense. Yeah, we, sure. we start there and then we pull back because we have to legally. We have to for compliance reasons. We have to to keep kids safe. Yeah, so there there is a line that there you is. can't cross. We over communicate until we can't communicate. Uh, when when someone when you are being asked for information, yeah, uh, in the public arena, yep, who are you typically responding to? Yeah, it, it's some combination of media, parents, staff, students, all at once. Social media, <laughs> anonymous <laughs> accounts <laughs> online, uh, um, you name it. And, and it, depending on the issue, you'll hear from more or less of each of those that I just referenced. Uh-huh. But you'll hear from all of them on, on almost every single one. And they all want to know right now what, what happened. I heard a thing, which usually is maybe not fully accurate. And I say <laughs> usually not. It is never fully accurate. Um, but I heard a thing. I want to know about a thing. I saw a post on Facebook. I huh. I uh, I heard a rumor that you fill in the blank is, is happening. Um, every single time we treat those questions as if they are real, even if they are not, and we mm-hmm. go through the same exact process. So we verify, and Josh and Gretchen can speak to this um, as you get into the operations of it. Uh, we treat each incident as if it is real. We treat inc- each incident as is as if it is incredibly serious. And that means we have to go vet the facts. So on my end, for my staff, um, they're crafting what needs to be communicated, what can be communicated. And then we turn to Josh and the operations folks. We turn to the Cobb County School District Police Department. We turn to Gretchen and our, our legal team. And we say, all right, here's what we want to say. Now, what can we say? What's accurate? What's legal? And uh, they can speak to that better than I can. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, I, that kind of leads into the question I had for Gretchen. She representing the the legal angle here. What are the what are those hard lines um, in the process? I mean, yeah, we could collect all of this information and then just dump it out in public, but we can't do that really. What what keeps us from doing that? So there's some big legal mandates that limit our ability to tell a story on all sorts of fronts, but in an emergency, but also when a parent's frustrated because they don't know, because they don't know um, how student discipline has been handled, right? Mm. Or they're frustrated because they don't know how employee situations have been handled. Those are all protected under actually multiple laws. And so we get to a point where there's a bunch of people telling one story and we are being asked other facts. And just mm-hmm. the reality is with personally identifiable information, we're not going to be sharing that information because we are not going to break the law. So the breaks go on where the law puts up a wall. Yeah. Um, and, and it is things, it, it's very specific things about who. You know, a lot of who questions are never gonna be answered. Even then, if people already know the who, then all of the what and the how and the why is very off limits, right? So there are all these pieces that become off limits in the process of communicating, which complicate John's team's job yeah. because it is, yeah, no, we can't, we can't say that. Can we try to make this practical for a second? Sure. Like just um, off the cuff, uh, hypothetical. So if there is a Facebook post that mm-hmm. says a thing is happening at a school, what happens? I, I can maybe start on my end. My folks might say, hey, we got a phone call. We got a media outlet. We saw a social media post that says a thing's happening at a school. What happens from there? 
I mean, I know I, what happens on my end. What happens on your end? Immediately, I get in touch with our Cobb County Campus Police Department, and we start investigating to take the, the social media post, where it's at, get our police involved, get our local school administration involved to try to find out the detail of it. A lot of a time, a lot of the time, it turns out to be a false threat, but we take it very seriously regardless. 99% um, of the time, I myself go out and assist the principal in the investigation. Um, our police department alongside with me if it is criminal in act. And from there, we take it to the next level if it's needed to be. And then on your end, we're checking in with you, we're checking in with legal on, hey, here's what we think's happened, here's what we think we can communicate, or do we have any student privacy issues, do we have any discipline privacy issues, do we have any um, potential uh, criminal issues, and that becomes really the final filter right before we communicate. Yes, and you did land on one thing I didn't mention, right? There is a piece of this of our partnership with law enforcement, yeah. which sometimes is our own public safety, but right. also a lot of times it's actually the different law enforcement agencies in the county. Right. Yep. And we absolutely don't want to impede an ongoing investigation. And sometimes, just mm -hmm. like you see in crime shows, right? Yeah. <laughs> you start sharing information and it gets in the way. And we meet with them regularly and then work with them yeah. even more frequently to figure out about what information should and shouldn't be shared at one point. So I, I didn't mention that other piece of their laws, but then there's also law enforcement and the consideration for how yeah. they want to handle any given situation. Yeah, it's like there's a lot of ingredients that are going into the cake. The parent, the community just wants the cake and there's a lot of pieces and it takes some time to put it together in the in the in the right way in yeah. the way that's going to taste good but also in a way that's well, going to be and and I think legal. it's important for everyone to know if it is criminal in act school administrators and myself are not involved in that investigation yeah. that is a police investigation and we could get in trouble for getting involved we immediately turn a criminal act over to the police department and we follow their lead yeah. when they are done with their investigation we start our investigation for school discipline wow so you actually you could be held in uh, uh basically liable for um Obstruction. Well, uh, obstruction, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and um, thinking about just the number of people we just mentioned in this little, very little hypothetical, which again, you're yeah. hearing in a school district with 113, you know, thousand kids, it's happening every day, every couple of days, a couple of times a day. Um, there are a lot of people who are involved in, in this chain of events, and we treat every single one. Our superintendent is very clear. Student safety is first, number one. What does that mean? Practically, that means when one of these things happen, we're dropping everything else. Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, is the, is the local school. Um, and there is a lot of people, both on the central office side, inside the local school, all the way down to the classroom, um, law enforcement agencies, as you said, who are involved in, number one, keeping the kids safe, and then, two, making sure we know what the facts are, and number three, we're communicating as much as we can. Um, and, and so these are very disruptive incidents. Like they take a right. lot of time. That's what we're here for. We're happy to do it. We also try to keep as much of that disruption outside of the school as possible. Um, and so when a mom and a dad, um, staff, other students want to know what's happening, um, we want to make sure we communicate up front. Hey, we know something's happening. We're looking into it. We'll tell you as much as we can next knowing that there's going to be some time as we verify what's actually happening and, again, making sure the kids are safe before we say anything else. I think it's also important to add that we're working 24-7. So when this happens in the evening, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, midnight, we are on the phone. We are getting people in place so that when your children come to school, they are safe. Yeah. Our actions don't stop at 5 o'clock at the end of the day. We work through the night when these threats come on social media in the middle of the night. We get made aware and we get the right people in the right place to make sure everyone is safe every day. And, and what I always say to my other parent friends, right, because they, they see things and then you get a text, right? Yeah. I'm sure you all get that too, right? Yeah. You get the text at, at 9, 10 o'clock at night like, hey, I heard. And I always say, as a parent, I am when they, when you hear about it, that's best case scenario because right. we know. Yeah. We know yeah. and we can address it. Yeah. Those aren't the ones you should be freaking out about. Not we, we in no way are dismissive or want to minimize them, but I am much comfortable personally 
knowing that we know what's going on because someone has put it in a some some way where we actually know and it's come to our attention. Yeah, somebody expressed the concern. Uh-huh. Right? We've mm-hmm. all been in in local schools for years, you know, thinking about these things over the course of I don't know, the last five or 10 years, there, there's definitely more of them now, right? I mm-hmm. mean, because everybody can communicate, mm-hmm. everybody's got a cell phone, everybody well, can I've, text. After COVID, especially for some reason. Yeah, COVID, yeah. I agree with you, has, has accelerated that too. People but got a little restless, um, mm-hmm. It's always been disruptive to the school. What, what have your all's experience been with, with that? When there's an incident at the school, how much, my experience has been that it takes a lot of time away from the school, an hour, two hours, three hours, even if it's a nothing. Yeah. And again, 99.9% of them are. It takes a lot away from teaching and learning. Um, Just has that been your experience? That's been mine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, definitely. As a former school principal, um, it, it was a majority of our day, making yeah. sure that great instructions going on in the classroom, but everyone is safe. And yeah. our superintendent has been very clear that that's our number one task, is to keep everyone safe every day. And as a former principal, parents, students were a big resource for keeping us safe because we had a, a process in place, see or hear something, say something. Let me know as building principal that there is a threat on social media about our school because that gets the wheel started for us yeah. to get the resources needed at the school to keep everyone safe. Yeah, that's that's spend vector, your time. Right? Is that Vector now yes, that we yes. have? Yeah. The tip line. The yeah. tip oh, line. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You can text, you can email, you can get onto a website. I can't tell you how many times um, Josh, when you're a principal, I mean, you pick up the phone, hey, just hearing a thing, that starts people moving. Again, what, probably unfounded, um, but we treat everyone like it is, and the more aggressive our students, our staff, and our parents are with communicating, the more we can do something about it sooner, and ultimately parents can hear more about it. You, you see all this stuff happening. The wheels are turning out there in, in the community. Yeah. What is the biggest frustration for you on the communication side when when you are let's say something happens at a school and you don't know all the facts yet what's the most frustrating thing for you yeah it goes a- back and your team yeah it goes back to the priority of, of student safety right so um, no matter what um, happens in, in 2023 related to student safety somebody is going to be upset about something that's okay we want to make sure that your kids safe right. and anything that gets in the way of safety is is frustrating I think it's frustrating for uh, our local uh, administration, for the PD, and certainly on the communication side, because everybody is working in overdrive, going 100 miles an hour, to not only go communicate, but to make sure that the kid's safe. And I'll start right there. When um, you get a question that comes in, you get a series of questions, you get uh, maybe uh, parents who, again, understandably and rightfully so, want to know what there is to know. When they get to the point of us saying, hey, we're aware and we're looking at it, we're investigating, we're doing everything we possibly can, anything that goes past that really slows slows the process down. Mm. Um, uh, just, just be practical. you got a principal at a school who says, hey, things happening, they're getting support from PD and from Josh and from Gretchen, myself, our people, um, and there's, again, many more people involved than what we just referenced. Um, and then w- and when the local admin is also trying to field phone calls and emails and ding, 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 yeah. ding, it's slowing down the process to make sure that we know that kids are safe first and foremost. You're keeping them from going to ask someone That's about right. what happened. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so if I'd say that in one sentence, it's um, it's our first priority is a first priority for a reason. And anything that gets in the way of that is, mm-hmm. is, a, is a bit frustrating. Um, and that's why we try to communicate as fast as we can and as accurately as we can, and we're just asking for some um, patience and understanding with that. Sure. Um, while we also understand, again, the panic when you read a Facebook post, you get a text message yeah. that says, hey, I think the very best thing you can do as a parent, student, or staff member is make sure, as Josh just said, make sure that we know, whether that's your local administration with your principal, because you walk in the principal's door and say, hey, I heard a thing, whether it's you go through the vector tip line, um, uh, pick up the phone. Uh, you, as long as we know, I promise you that is the safest thing you can do for your kid. Probably safer than getting in the car and driving to the school. Probably safer than um, you know telling your kid to you know walk down the street so you can come pick them up. Um, that's the very oh, yeah. best thing you can do. We've got lots of people who, who love your children. I, I think too, for me, because I'm I'm usually you know the person like can we say this right? So I think the most frustrating piece for me is that as as we said at the beginning, you know we are parents. 
And so just out of empathy, like I get the desire to know. I get it. And I wish the answer was mm-hmm. yes. And I also, for my colleagues, wish the answer yeah. was yes, because people would not then create their own narrative or get very frustrated that they don't actually know what's yeah. going on. But the reality is we aren't allowed to do that. And so for me, the frustration is, yeah, I, I wish the answer was yes. That's you, I wish yeah. I could tell you that. Yeah. You just said something uh, really cool, and that is uh, people creating their own narrative. Um, the old telephone game, yep. you know, that, that has actual meaning in this cir- circumstance, right? Where somebody puts something out on social and then they try to pass that along, and before long you find out, well, it, it was a horrible thing, or really it was nothing. Uh, but it, either way, it's not true. Well, and we're um, we the district, um, which you know this is this is this is my work family, so this is important to us. Yeah. We end up um, we we can't tell our side of the story. And again, thinking as a parent, right? Two kids come to you, tell you something. Like one of them, one of your children, says, "Johnny hit me." You're not just going to take Johnny's like the child's word. You're actually going to say, "Johnny, did you hit her?" We don't ever get to answer that second question. Oh. So it's always one-sided. And, and when you're telling your own story, it's always gonna be the story you want heard. There, there's not sure. gonna be, well, the district has done X, Y, and Z in, in various cases, right? And I'm back a little more to the discipline and the HR stuff, but it is, as I said, it's a one-sided narrative, always in the best light of the person telling the story. Yeah. And if, I, if I can give um, Josh and his team and um, our superintendent and our board a lot of credit, it is not easy to feel that pressure. Hey, we want to know more. We want to know a thing and make decisions based on safety, not based on pressure. Right? The easiest thing to do is to say, hey, we want to get to yes. We want to say as much as we can. Yep. Gretchen just said it. That is easy. Yeah. That is not right. what's best for kids <clears throat> when yeah. it comes down to safety, when it comes down to uh, a code yellow, a code <laughs> red, a rumored code yellow, a rumored code red, which really in today's day and age is the vast majority of them. They're really right. rumors of issues, not actual issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but I give a lot of credit to those who are making the hard operational decisions without compromising student safety, because honestly, it's the easiest thing to do in today's day and age is just get to yes, because right. that's what it's we hear. That's what, yeah. that's what we hear, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, it takes a lot to, to hold the position, right? That's right. So as we wrap this up, uh, l- let me just throw a wild card at you guys. Don't don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> um, ha- do you have any uh, memories of an incident that uh, – kind of stand out yeah and obviously gretchen no specifics <laughs> no no identifying like, uh characteristics of this. Yeah. <laughs> like david um, have you been listening <laughs> right but um uh, just a, a general description of uh something that happened i think one of you uh mentioned uh popcorn you, you know burning in the microwave mm-hmm. um is that the sort of thing that typically does Throw everybody into, you know, all hands on deck, investigate. Mm -hmm. I'll use that one just because it's funny and we mentioned it and I won't name the school and it's going back a couple (laughs) years, but um, we had um, rumors of a building that was on fire with about 50 parent cars who showed up at at one of our buildings because it was posted on social media and, you know, got to go come rescue your, your, your kid. Sure enough, there was some smoke and, and, and there was, Um, I'm not sure how much smoke because at the end of the day it was. Um, some popcorn that was left in a microwave and you had some building smoke that came out of that. Wow. But it was obviously being dealt with inside of the building. You know, hey, we got some smoke in the building. We can smell something. We got to go find it. But by the time um, popcorn was literally taken out of the microwave, um, you had kids who were on cell phones who were notifying mom and dad, putting it on social media. Um, and then moms and dads, again, understandably, all you know is you're, you know, you're at home, you're at mm-hmm. work, you're getting a text message. You're saying, hey, there, I, there's smoke here. Next thing you know, you're, you're in your car to come get your kid um, um, that, that's probably one of the more memorable ones but it also I think illustrates this idea of moms and dads are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, the building is doing what it's supposed to be doing making sure kids are safe and what I think what we're asking for what you're hearing is if you hear it from us it's accurate know that if we know that your kid is as safe as they can be um, and we'll tell you as much detail as we can as soon as the popcorn's out of the microwave so, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. And, and, and to finish on that when you hear from us what channel of 
hearing would would parents have? Yeah, we've done a lot, particularly over the course of the last five or six years, just to make sure that we're communicating on all channels. So uh, um, parents have choice in that through the CTLS parent app, and they can choose their primary method of communication. Some okay. prefer the app itself because it notifies straight on the phone. Some prefer text message. Some prefer email. Some prefer all. Um, yeah. And we communicate with each of those methods. Our principals are communicating usually directly to their um, to their parents through those three means. It depends on the circumstance. Sometimes we'll get on social. Um, we typically get questions into the into the district, whether that's by email or by phone, and we make sure that there's responses there as well. But if if you are communicated, uh, if you prefer to be communicated in a particular way, we're making sure that you're hearing it. CTLS parent is is the key. That's where I would start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think to to piggyback on the popcorn story, <laughs> I think it's important for parents and community to know. We're always going to act in the, the direction of safety. Yeah. So while we knew that was popcorn, the building was still evacuated because the fire alarm went off, okay. and we wanted to make sure that there's not something else that's causing that alarm to go off. So we're always following our alert system and doing what we need to do to keep students and staff safe. And if something is going on in a community near a school, we're going to put a school into a lockdown. Yeah. And a lock out and make sure that until we know what exactly is going on, we're going to react in the side of safety every single time. Gotcha. So I can give you one more example story. Yeah, I um, love it. Some of our schools are on really main thoroughfares where you actually can see the parking lots or the campuses from the street. So yeah. one of our high schools, about 10 o'clock in the morning, blows up all over social media and thus my phone too. Um, <laughs> Why are there cop cars? There are like nine cop cars in front of blah, 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 school. What's happening? Blah, blah, blah. And then I heard blah, 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 blah. It happened to actually be a drill, which we do run. Um, so it was a great thing that yep. we had a whole bunch of a police presence yep. there because it wasn't just our public safety. It was actually, again, in conjunction with outside law enforcement. So it was this big drill we were running. No, you know no big harm or foul we intentionally run some unannounced drills there's there is great impact to that right later in the day the principal sent out a very nice communication here's what we did today blah 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 but there was a lot of of concern anxiety and anxiety yeah. and people providing information without verifying it on yeah. social media that created it just amplified all of it so. Yeah, and I, I, I'll just piggyback on that. That's a great example of when, if we have to choose between student safety and the value of unannounced safety drills, which we believe in strongly, PD informs to us and says, hey, that's going to keep your building and your kids safer. And then the parent says, hey, well, we didn't know about the drill on the front end. Well, that's true. Because if we have to pick between student safety and anything else, we're picking student safety. And we're going to make sure we communicate as much as we can as soon as we can, which yeah. in that case is after the drill's over. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a great example of when you have competing priorities. Hey, I want to know more. Tell me more. Tell me sooner. And student safety, we pick student safety every time. Well, I, I can't thank you guys enough for coming in and, and discussing this because I know there are a lot of parents out there who uh, probably have felt that anxiety. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when they hear something on social, uh, that's probably the biggest yeah. source of mis misinformation right. at times. Um, it, it really, the blood pressure goes high when. Yeah. <laughs> and I you work guys here and I react yeah. that yeah. way, right? Sure, like, sure. If it's my because kid's school if, too, I'm like, if Whoa, nothing what's else, going you're on? identifying with the other parents who have a child in the building, yeah. right? And yeah. uh, so it's very important. So thank you so much for for coming in. So if you found this podcast helpful, please subscribe and pass it along to a friend. As the school year progresses, we'll make sure you're, you're staying knowledgeable on the topics that affect you. And you can also look back at the 100 previous episodes that we've done. Something in there might be of interest to you. You can find them on the district website at www.cobk12.org. Just go to the bottom of the page and you'll find the link right there. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Inside Scoop, a podcast produced by the Cobb County School District.